Believe it or not, the midterm elections are less than one week away. Now, all that the GOP needs to do is win back five seats and they retake control of the House of Representatives. Now, in the event this election were taking place over the summer after Americans were collectively outraged about the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade, momentum would have been in the Democratic Party's favor. But time has passed, and considering that the memory of the average American is comparable to a goldfish, well, the outrage has died down, and now the propaganda has set in, and the momentum has shifted back in the GOP's favor. So there's a lot of different races where they could pick up those five seats, I think, pretty easily. One of them that I did not consider was Katie Porter's seat. Now, Cook Political Report has considered her seat as lean Democrat, but as of late, that has since shifted, and they're now considering her race a toss-up, which is really troubling because Katie Porter is, I think, one of the most effective communicators for the Democratic Party. So if they lose her, I think that would be catastrophic. So Business Insider explains the Cook Political Report on Tuesday released a new analysis that moved California's 47th congressional district from a lean Democratic rating to a toss up showing signs that Porter might not cruise to reelection. Porter currently represents the 45th congressional district in a longtime Republican stronghold that she flipped blue in 2018. The area was redistricted after the 2020 cycle to the 47th Congressional District, which covers a large swath of Orange County, an affluent area that includes Irvine, where Porter resides, along with the coastal cities of Huntington Beach, Laguna Beach, and Newport Beach. So what she already managed to accomplish back in 2018 when she flipped that seat was very, very impressive. But the district has changed a little bit because of redistricting. And now they're calling this a toss up, not necessarily because she's losing, but because the popular vote margin that they predicted for her has decreased. So it went from about 54%. This is an estimate uh, down to 52.7%. So she's very close with her Republican opponent, Scott Baugh. Now, considering the ways in which she picked up momentum over the years, I feel not as doomer about this particular race because back in 2018, she won by three points. And in 2020, she actually increased her lead in that district uh, and she won by seven points. So it's not like... It's a foregone conclusion that Katie Porter is going to lose, but given how close it is, it's a little bit too close for comfort, uh, comfort. and I think that the Democratic Party apparatus needs to invest money at the last minute to make sure that they protect this seat, because losing her would be catastrophic, I think, for the party. And I have my policy disagreements with Katie Porter. I don't think that she's the perfect candidate, but in terms of being able to explain eloquently the issues affecting the American people and how this economy screws over working class people, I think that she's an asset to the party without question. So to kind of demonstrate that, I want to play an interview that she had with Chris Hayes recently, where she explains why inflation is happening. It's largely due to corporate greed. Let's watch. Well, so this inflationary period is different, and that's what the study shows, that's what the research shows that I was talking about in the hearing that you just played. 54 cents of every extra dollar that we are being asked to pay is going to corporate profits, and here's why. Because the market power of these big corporations has grown. As small businesses, medium-sized businesses have been gobbled up by larger businesses, squeezed out by the pandemic, unable to deal with their supply chain issues, the largest corporations bankrolled by Wall Street have gotten more and more powerful. So what we find is that the, the biggest price gouging goes on in the very industries where there are the biggest players. Things like big oil, where we only have a handful of companies that dominate the market and control the supply. And in fact, as far as I can tell, and I've seen some of this on some of the business networks and in the business press, uh, when speaking to investors, some of the, the CEOs of these entities are, are quite frank about this. They, they use the term sometimes pricing power to describe why they're able to now in this environment extract more profits. 
No, absolutely. And let's be clear about what pricing power feels like to the mom like me in the grocery store. It feels like getting ripped off by Wall Street because that's exactly what's happening. And the American people understand this. They understand that they're being asked to pay more for, in some cases, less product. And it's unfair and it's wrong. It's an economy that is centered on Wall Street rather than being centered on workers. And Republicans have made very clear that if they win back this Congress, the very face that first thing they're going to do is give Wall Street an even bigger handout in the form of corporate tax cuts. That's the wrong direction. What we need to be doing is focusing on increasing competition, which helps consumers pay fair prices. Yeah, I want to go back to those three categories because I think it, it makes sense for folks intuitively to break it down, right? So if, a, if you go in and a box of cereal costs two bucks more than you're used to paying, right? The, 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 the reason could be, hey, look, our, we have to pay our workers more. So our labor costs have gone up. Or it could be um, the ingredients in this box of cereal as well as the shipping costs have gone up and we need to pass that on to you, the consumer. And I think people both understand and kind of abide those two. The third category is we can just get away with charging two bucks extra and it's good for our shareholders. And the contention here is that it's really the latter category. No, absolutely. And look, early in the pandemic, I think consumers understood that there had been exactly. disruption yeah. to things like supply chains. There had been disruption to workers and it was it was challenging to get labor. But I think what they see now is that Wall Street's greed is insatiable and they will continue to charge consumers and take advantage of them until we elect policymakers who will stand up to corporate power. And that's exactly what I'm willing to do. I don't take corporate PAC money. I don't take lobbyists. I don't work for Wall Street. I work for the families that I represent. And that means I want an economy that works for them. And to do that, we have to have policymakers who are on the right side of this, sh this issue. So she makes it abundantly clear within a matter of minutes that the thing that is hurting Americans, what's driving inflation is corporate greed and reining in corporate power, going after them, that is going to be the key to delivering for working class Americans. This is not only a factual argument based on data, but it's a populist argument because she is taking on corporations, which I don't know if you've checked lately, lots of Americans aren't necessarily too happy with them. So I feel like this is a winning message. So in the event her populist economic message loses to some GOP message virtue signaling about CRT and drag shows, then I will have no faith in the American people, at least in that district, because this is what Americans presumably want to hear. There was a poll that came out that showed that seven out of 10 Republicans care more about a strong economy than a functioning democracy. So here is a Democrat who has a populist message who's saying, I know exactly what to do to stop inflation, to put more money in your pocket. We're going to go after these large multinational corporations that are literally just price gouging you to increase shareholder value. So if that doesn't resonate with, with voters, then genuinely, I don't know what will. Now, it's a little bit more complicated than just the messages of these candidates. A lot of it has to do with momentum, right? If a lot of these GOP voters were previously demoralized because Katie Porter was pretty strong, but they see a national trend is swinging towards the GOP. Well, that could galvanize more Republicans to get out. It's kind of like a bandwagon effect. And on top of that, if Democratic Party voters feel as if there is GOP momentum and all hope is gone, then that could encourage them to stay home. So the reason why I'm making this video is to let you all know that if you live in a district that's a toss up or even a safer lean D district, you shouldn't take that for granted and make a prediction and base your decision to vote or not vote on that prediction. Because trust me, the polls oftentimes and the predictions aren't a representation of what happens in reality. They're just kind of a gauge of where voters are at, but you can never take that into consideration fully. You have to just vote. So if you live in this district, get your ass out there and vote for Katie Porter. Because again, I have my policy disagreements with her. But if the Democratic Party lost her, this would be horrible for them. So they should be doing everything in their power to protect her. Joe Biden and other Democrats should be campaigning for her because she is a very talented order. And to lose her, to lose these viral videos that she produces where she grills CEOs and Wall Street executives with her whiteboard, that would be really bad for the Democratic Party. I think that more Democrats need to emulate her strategy and speak about these issues the way that she speaks about them with clarity, focus, and data. 
and she just has to be protected. So if you live in this district, for the love of God, just get out there and vote for Katie Porter because the Democratic Party can't afford to lose her and I don't think Americans can afford to lose her.